Welcome to Judaism 201, the uh, Birchas Shachar, the 15 Brachas, part three. I think this might end up being five parts, but we'll see. Um, so we're going to pick up, uh, we're doing the order, going through the order that the Sephardim and uh, Hasidim do, and uh, and the, uh, the Chabad Siddur. Um, so in that Siddur, the sixth Bracha is what we're up to, which is Leya'ev Koach which means give strength to the weary. Um, now, the curious, a couple of curious things about that bracha. So first of all, um, what are we doing being weary first thing in the morning? If it had said bleary, I might be able to relate to that. Um, but uh, weary is usually indicates, you know, we've, you know, we've been up, we're, we're working and uh, we're tired. And at night, you know, we can uh, we could use the strength, um, and even more so in previous generations, where the work that most people did outside of the house was physical labor, so they were really weary. Um, and hopefully, you know, this this shouldn't give the impression that uh, we're already tired or weary first thing in the morning. Um, the other curious thing about this bracha is that. Um, it's not mentioned in the Gemara. We talked, uh, we've mentioned a couple times already that uh, the Gemara and Bruchas stuff 60 talks about uh, the Bruchas you say in the morning and that you do them during a particular action. So when we open our eyes, we say, Pokeh Ivrim, gives, gives eyesight to the blind. When we get dressed, we say, Malbi Sharamim, you close the naked. Um, but there's no, um, but but this this one isn't mentioned in the Gemara. It was added a little bit later, um, and because of that, there's no particular action associated with it. So, what it what's the point of of this bracha then? Um, so, uh, Rav Baruch Epstein says that therefore it must be a bracha about the future. Um, since obviously it can't be that, that we're already weary from the things we've been doing today. So what we're doing on the, on the very simple less meaning is, you know, since we are most rested in the morning when we wake up, so we're anticipating that at some point, for me, it usually comes around three or four or five, you know, we, we hit this wall, we sort of run out of steam and we're tired, you know, I would, the biorhythms, whatever, you know, we're hitting a low point. Um, and uh, we want to get, we want to push through that. Um, that reminds me of a story I heard that, that there's this uh, Rebbe who, uh, when, his, when a student would say, I'm, I'm tired, he would say, that's good. You're supposed to be tired. That means you're working hard. Um, so we, we are created in order to accomplish and achieve. Um, and sometimes we kind of need to dig deep to, uh, to get that energy to, to, to plow on through. Um, and so this bracha indicates that we're looking to Hashem to give us that koach, that, that, that strength uh, to do that. The words themselves are from a pasuk in Yeshiahu in Isaiah, um, where it says, no saying le of koach, actually it's the exact same three words. Um, and it says, uh, and um, Isaiah Yeshiahu is, is praising Hashem for giving us strength to those who follow his ways. So Rav Ari Leib Gordon suggests, um, th uh, this is on a whole deeper level or a whole parallel level with this bracha is, is that he's talking about uh, nationally and collectively uh, living in exile. And the point here to be blunt and dramatic about it is that we have, we're tired and we've, we've had enough of being on the run and living with a, a, oppression and, you know, running from the Cossacks and running from the Nazis. And we're tired of this galus already. We're tired of this exile already. And please give us strength in order to, to get through this. Um, hopefully we're, we're near the end of this. Um, so he's, he suggests that uh, the rabbis added this prayer into the sitter in order to, uh, to, to fortify us as a nation 
to give us strength to get through another day in exile. Um, so whether we're talking individually or collectively as a nation, we know that when we're tired, we have this reservoir of strength within us if we can look to Hashem or connect with Hashem. The next prayer, I don't know what order it is in your sitter is, um, it's Roka Aretz Al Hamayim. Um, that, let's see, in my sitter, the translation is, spreads forth the earth above the waters. Um, and the Gemara says you're supposed to say that when you descend from your, bre from your bed onto the ground. So I think of all the 15 brachas, um, this one seems the hardest to understand. How does that relate to us? Um, we already have a bracha for when we stand up straight. Um, and the bracha is, is sort of indicating, the, the rabbis tell us that um, uh, on a very simple level that when we stand on the earth, we don't sink into the ground and that the ground is firmly beneath our feet. So I, that seems kind of trivial. So what, what's the deeper meaning of that expression? Um, and the deeper meaning is this, is, is that the earth is um, constructed in such a way, and that's indicated by, again, the words are, spreads forth the earth above the waters. The point is that the waters and, the, and the, the earth, the ground that we step on are separated and they have their own parts. What do they say that like three quarters of the earth is water and we're on the land part and we don't have a problem with that part. Um, but even, even deeper, uh, it, it's looking towards the miracle of our existence. How many weird things have to happen that all have to align just right for earth and life on earth to exist, right? If the earth were a little bit closer to the sun, we'd have runaway global warming. Hopefully we don't already have that. If it were further away, it would be too cold to be hospitable. Um, the moon is just is just the right size and just the right distance that it affects the tides, which which causes the waters to move around, which causes the wind to move around, which, you know, we need that movement to, to stir up and, and, and mix up life on Earth. And even more dramatically, um, for those who remember, uh, hopefully you covered this in your um, high school chemistry class, um, we know that uh, almost all, almost everything shrinks when it gets colder. Um, except uh, we know that water increases in size by about 10%. It's a very weird thing that uh, water has that almost nothing else has. Um, and it has to do with the molecular structure and the bonds and all kinds of things. Um, and because it expands, that means it floats. And because it floats, um, that means when it gets to say 25 degrees, it means that the lake doesn't turn into a big block of ice because if ice didn't float, you'd have ice forming on the top and then it would sink to the bottom. And then more ice would float to the top and it would sink to the bottom. And within a day, a lake would be totally frozen and all the fish in it would, would die or whatever fish do in, in frozen, you know, the life would die. Um, and if it got really cold, the, the oceans would be a big block of ice too. It'd be, it'd be a disaster. It's just, just water itself is just such a miracle, um, including uh, my having a uh, one second. Water itself is such a miracle that you know, it's perfectly balanced. You know, if we remember the pH system, we have the H and the OH, and that's all there is to water. It's just and that's just one element. Uh, or one molecule, a, a major part of the earth. The, the, the point is that the whole universe is constructed as though on a knife's edge in terms of everything has to be just right. What do they call that? Uh, you know, the earth is in the Goldilocks zone, you know, not too close, not too far, you know, not too hot, not too cold. Um, and, and there's so much that has to go right in order for us to be protected. So for example, you know, if you live in Florida, uh, you know, there's always a risk of hurricanes and Florida is precariously positioned as, you know, it's not on very high ground. You don't need a lot to go wrong for uh, the whole state to get flooded um, in any event. So that's Rokah Aretz Al-Hamayim. Um, 
a very interesting one is the next one that we're going to cover, Hamechin Mitzade Gaver. Now, um, that's interesting here. So, um, every translation I've seen of that says either who directs the steps of man or who guides who guides us on our path, that sort of thing. But the word mechin literally means to prepare. And preparing, if we look at it as prepare, um, it really, it fits beautifully with all the explanations of what this prayer is already supposed to, uh, is supposed to mean. So there must be something else going on why none of the sitters translate it that way. But in any event, um, what's interesting about this prayer is that we now transition from, we, we've had this string of prayers and we're now transitioning from Hashem's graciousness, graciousness to me to Hashem empowering us to take steps and to go out into the world. Well, so the obvious is, meaning for this is that we are thankful that we can get around. Um, I but have a question. I'm sorry? I have a question. Yes. What is for this blessing what is the feminine parallel? Um, so the point of that is that Hashem is empowering us to give us, uh, Hashem has already empowered us to take steps. Um, and it's, it's us to up to make, to make use of those steps. Um, we have the ability to go out into the world, um, but what we do with that ability is up to us. Um, you know, there's this idea that um, you know, uh, wherever wherever a person wants to go is where he will be led. You know, if we if we are determined to follow our Yetzer Hara, um, Hashem will let us, and we'll make a mess of ourselves, and we'll get into trouble. Uh, we learn this from from Bilam actually. You know, Bilam was determined. It comes up uh, in, in a week or two in the Parsha, in Parsha's Balak. Bilam. Uh, is is determined to go and, and get get paid for cursing Jews, and uh, after he prays to Hashem a second time, uh, he, he prays the first time for permission. Hashem says, "Don't go," and then he prays again. You know, he wants to go, and Hashem says, "Fine, you know, go ahead and go." Um, uh, and so Rashi brings this uh, Gemara that says that where, where a person is determined to go, um, he will be led. Um, so we don't want to be led in the wrong direction. Um, but perhaps there's a, a deeper reason, and I, I really like this one. There's, a, there's an Ashkenazi custom that when a person gets up from Shiva on the morning of the seventh day after Shacharis, he or she goes for a walk around the block. Um, so w what's that about? And I, I think there's a beautiful, a really beautiful uh, meaning to this. Um, a person who's sitting Shiva necessarily has just lost somebody very precious, has lost somebody that's irreplaceable. And it's natural to think at those dark times, how can I go on? How can I persevere through this? It's like the whole world for them has come to a standstill for a week. Um, you know, depending on how, how much you observe it, right? You haven't been watching TV. You don't, you don't know what the news is going on. You haven't been on your phones. You um, haven't been learning. It's like the world's been on pause for a week. Um, so the idea, of, the idea of, of getting up from Shiva and walking around is that we get up and we put one foot in front of the other and we walk around the block and then, lo and behold, we arrive at our destination, which is home, um, and the message, which is where you come from, and and the message is that we can't heal overnight. Um, we heal incrementally in small steps, and there's that uh, right that uh, Chinese proverb that uh, everybody likes to quote all the time, right? A, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And so we have the capacity to put one foot in front of the other. We don't have to solve the world's problems overnight. And more importantly, we don't have to solve our own problems and our own lifestyle issues that we would like to change and improve. We don't have to do those overnight. Um, we have the capacity 
thank God, to be patient, to move incrementally. Um, and although sometimes we're overwhelmed and we're challenged, there's illnesses, crises in our lives, crises at work. Um, you know, we're, sometimes we're overwhelmed with how much we have to do. Um, and, and we wonder, you know, uh, uh, how, how is it all going to work out? Um, and that can either be in the short range, you know, you have a, you have some major deadlines at work or you're overwhelmed at work. How's this going to work? You know, a month from now, what, what, I'm going to look back on this. Yeah, how will it work out? Sometimes it's with kids, you, know, you don't know for a decade or two or three, you know, I still don't know. My, my, my kids are in their mid to late twenties. I still don't know how it, it's all actually going to work out. Um, but we make a bracha every day that, um, our mission is, is not to finish it all today, but just to get to the end of today successfully. And what does successfully mean? Well, I, the first thing is that we were productive today. And the way to do that is to put one foot in front of the other, one step at a time, which, of course, you know, makes us think of uh, the famous, one of my favorite uh, Perke Avos in chapter two, Rabbi Tarfan says, it's not your responsibility to finish the work, but you're not free to desist from it either. So um, in summary, we're thankful that we have mobility and that we can walk around, but the deeper meaning is, is that we are, uh, what we do with that ability to move around is up to us. Hashem prepared us, um, again, mechin is to prepare. He pre prepared us for this moment. All the prior brachas were that we can see, we can move, we have clothes, we have our basic needs. But what we do with them is up to us. And it's also a reminder that we should not feel overwhelmed, but that what I have to do today, um, what I can accomplish, um, I, I can do by taking everything one step at a time. Um, I, think, uh, I think we can squeeze one more in here. And then we'll call it a day. Sha'asa li kol tarki is an interesting one um, that, uh, that provides us with all our needs. Um, provides us with, with every need. So we say, we're supposed to say that when we put on our shoes. So the question is, what's with the shoes? Because we already said who clothes the naked, Malbi Sharamim. Um, so Abu Dram, the Abu Dram who uh, wrote a monumental seminal work in the 13th century, I think, um, a, a major commentary in the Siddur, um, he says that shoes represent our capacity to be independent and to get around. This, this sort of relates a little bit to, um, to, the, to the previous bracha. So something to think about with this, with this prayer is is that um, there's, there's always a tension between the idea that God gave us the tools to be independent, and yet on the other hand, we're not completely independent of Hashem. Um, yeah, also, also, sorry for so when, when we mock. So there is a, there's a question of why is it when Moshe was at the burning bush, Hashem said, take off your shoes because you're standing in a holy place. Um, and also on the Har Habayas, uh, the grounds where the temple stands, we're supposed to take off our shoes. Um, and there's an idea that when we want to feel utterly dependent upon Hashem, uh, we, we, we take off our shoes, um, meaning that, you know, we don't have a place to go. Um, right here is where I want to be. Um, and I want to be totally connected with what's going on around me at this moment. So we take our shoes off in order to become connected. Um, and, and in fact, uh, so you might ask, it's a good question. So why don't we take our shoes off when we're davening at shul? And in, in fact, I, I don't know if the Sephardi do uh, actually practice that. I know the Rambam, the Sephardi usually follow the Rambam. The Rambam uh, is just assumes that that uh, that you're going to be davening barefoot because that's the way it was in in his lands all the time and I th I think the Muslims um, daven w without shoes on uh, the idea again is you know we uh, th during davening um, or at a time when we're 
feeling particularly holy. We want to be totally connected to what's going on here. Um, and as Michael mentioned, you know, there's also a custom to take our shoes off when we're mourning. And that's why Ashkenazim do not take their shoes off now, because we don't want to mix mourning with, uh, with, with davening, with tefillah. Um, on a deeper level, this bracha is that um, is the only word that has is the only bracha that has the word li in it, which means to me. And the idea is that we want to internalize that it's, it's not just about the shoes that empowers us, but that each of us has what we need by definition. This goes along with the idea that Hashem puts us where we need to be and that we always need to differentiate between what our needs are and what our wants are. Um, so just as an aside, uh, you know, there's two days a year when we do dive in without shoes or actually not without shoes completely, but without leather shoes. And that is on Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur. And on those two days, we skip this bracha. So in summary, this bracha you know, the shoes are not meant to be, or it's meant to be taken both literally and figuratively. So literally, because we have what we need in order to navigate through life, and figuratively, in that Hashem provides for us individually, in a way, a, a, a custom fit with what we need. So on one hand, we're, we have our own independence, and we need to exercise that. On the other hand, we're not completely independent from, from Hashem. Alrighty, um, next week we're going to have, um, I wouldn't miss next week for all the, the tea in China. Um, next week we're going we're to take a break from the brachas and we're going to do a really cool idea on the Parsha um, that will blow your mind. And, um, and then we'll also, uh, at the end, we'll talk about, I think next week is right before the 17th of Thomas, we'll also talk about the three weeks. So thank you for coming and hopefully I'll see you next week. Yeah.